So we'll be in Matthew chapter 7. Um, and when I start reading, I'll begin in verse 21. Very, very common knowledge kind of verse. Um, I remember one time standing out in uh, Chattanooga, we were preaching. And a young man comes up to me and he's wearing a muscle shirt, a real short shorts. Young guy, looked like the normal guy out there. And here come his wife and she was wearing tank top, Daisy Dukes, four levels of dyed hair and all this stuff. Now, we know that God looks on the heart, the outside. is Sinners look like they act. Just remember that. Amen. Well, both of them proceeded to come up and tell me how they were saved at age four. And I said, well, do you remember that? And the one said, not really, but my mother said I was sincere. He says, as a matter of fact, we're going to, and I can't remember where it was, and I think it might have been uh, Columbia, as missionaries in their 20s. Had no idea what they were doing, where they were going. And as I started talking to them about what the Bible says about salvation, that there's no such thing as a four-year-old getting saved. Not in the Bible. Amen? You don't even hear of a ten-year-old getting saved in the Bible. Yeah. I said, are you sure about it? He said, well, I'm not sure, but my mother says I was serious about it. So, And boy, what a heartbreaker. What a heartbreaker. But that's a common thing. It's a common thing. Uh, you can talk to almost any fundamentalist and they believe that children are to be saved, but they don't get it from the Bible. Right. The only thing you can get from the Bible is Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, that means they're saved? No. At four, if they come unto him, no. Amen. That's right. All he was doing was playing with them and blessing them. Yeah. Amen. So there's no, and boy, that's scary because I had a testimony as being saved at seven. That was my testimony, and then of course all through life, as I got into trouble over my sin, I would always convince myself. But you know, I'm saved because I got saved at seven, and it's nowhere in the Bible that that even occurs. And thank God when I was 27, a preacher preached the gospel and and I'm telling you, I had to hear it for a while, but it's not what you prayed, it's not what you said, it's not what you volunteered, it's not what you committed to, it's do you naturally live for Jesus? And when you hear something from the Scripture, does it offend you? Or does it make you want to live more for Jesus? And I'm sorry, but there's many, many, many people going to hell because they're putting their stock in their salvation as a child. Then I've heard other people as they they grow older, they'll say things now, now Lord, if I'm not really saved, will you save me now? That's That's not salvation. Salvation is not, well, if I'm not, would you go ahead and do it? Kind of like you're paying for S&H green stamps. Some of y'all remember what those are. Amen? No. Salvation is when God wrecks your heart over who you are. And then, then when you turn and you trust Him by faith through that repentance, that begins your life right there. There's a lot of people say, yeah, I was a kid and I realized I wasn't saved. So later, I gave my heart to Jesus. You know, I, uh, I got saved when I was this age, but later I got right with Him. That was my testimony. Wrong. Can't find that in the Bible. Can't find it. Just can't find it. Don't want to find it because it's not. It doesn't belong there. But the overwhelming amount of testimonies I know of come from children, as children. That's the whole purpose of Vacation Bible School. Why would you have Vacation Bible School? It's to get those numbers to get them in, and then oh, then we get their parents. None of that sounds like preaching the gospel in the public and the Holy Ghost wrecks their hearts. None of that sounds like that. It sounds like a um, uh, public relations program, doesn't it? Marketing and so on, because that's what it is. And the worst part is people will say things like, yeah, Brother Sam, I know what you mean. As a kid, I made a profession, but later I got saved. I say, okay, then what? What did you do then? Well, nothing. I, I live for Jesus now. What well, did you get baptized? Well, why would I do that? I've already been baptized. You're not baptized until after you're saved. Amen? So you're in disobedience. I'm supposed to believe you're saved. And it doesn't matter what I believe. But I'm supposed to believe you're saved. You're telling me you're saved and, and you, don't want ba- you don't want baptism of the Bible? You, you don't want... Well, I can't change churches because you know that's where Ma and them go. You're lost! 
Lost. I don't want to go to what the Bible says. Matter of fact, I don't even care what the Bible says. I'm going to do what feels good and what I like, and it's good for my family. Lost people. Lost people. Amen. I know. I've been there. I've been there. And I thank God that now the verses I'm about to read does not apply to me. Oh, but they did one day. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now what's the first way to get into the kingdom of heaven? By being born again. Not everyone that says unto me is born again. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's right. It's not a work salvation, but you naturally want to do. You don't want to be a Protestant. Yeah. You won't want to be a Catholic when you learn these things. Right. Um, anyway, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, see, uh, I've known you since I was a kid, said the prayer. Have we not prophesied in thy name? In other words, preachers are going to be standing right here. That's it. Yep. That have said some prayer at age three or four. Yep. And have grown up the 1% that actually lives it out. No one else does. Have you ever noticed that? Churches are rife with kids that all rebel. Yep. And then they don't. Then you look at them. Boy, the women all have careers. They don't care about taking care of their husband or kids at home. They don't right. care about... They all get on the same birth control. Yep. They all celebrate the same things the world does. Yep. Don't tell me they're saved. They're in this mess. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? I'm going to tell you, I've cast out a lot of devils in my life. And a lot of people can do that. The Bible tells us in Mark, you can cast a devil out of your life and try to sweep and garnish your house. But if the Holy Spirit ain't there... If you ain't saved and you're just trying to live it, that devil's going to come back and you're going to be way worse than what you were. And that's why that young man, I said, let me show you what the Bible says about salvation. You'll never see a kid getting saved in the Bible. You'll never see that. And, and this is what it says. He goes, yeah, yeah, but he's so brainwashed. It's like seven more devils have come back and the end state is worse than the beginning. Because they won't listen now. In thy name done many wonderful works... Man, we gave money so that they could have water over here and we had a muscular dystrophy telethon at our church and we did this and we did that. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What a sad thing. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He's talking to people that went to church their whole life. He's talking to people that on the outside they look like a Christian. They, they were a whited wall or a clean platter. But on the inside they were ravening wolves or corruption like a grave. Charles Spurgeon said this, not that I go along with everything Charles Spurgeon had to say, but he is the E.F. Hutton of Baptist ranks. Is he not? When, when Charles Spurgeon speaks, everybody listens, right? But he said this, and I, and I agree with it. The devil is such a master of deception that he can make men dance upon the brink of hell as though they were on the verge of heaven. Jesus utters the most shocking and sobering statement that I think I have ever heard in my life that millions are absolutely going to be surprised at going to hell. Their hearts are so hard in their, quote, way I got saved, they don't care if it's biblical or not. If you don't have a biblical salvation, you don't have salvation. And you will not gain the biblical heaven. And you will not find a biblical church. And you will not live a biblical lifestyle. You'll live at it. You'll live at it until you find yourself in hell. Wow. I want to talk about false professions as children. Now, I've talked about this a whole lot because it is not only rife in Baptist circles, but I think it's the bane of Baptist circles. Little kids saying prayers. They got in, hell got robbed. All these things. And it's a show. Specifically, I want to speak concerning children who make false professions 
and think that they're saved their whole life. And how sensitive this matter is. I don't come into it lightly. But I want to tell you this matter, this subject is more important than if you need brain surgery. Can children be saved? Well, I'll tell you this, there's absolutely no Scripture concerning children getting born again at all. There's definitely no Scripture of the sprinklings that we see and so on these days. And there are reasons that many, many people will be moral as compared to the rest of the world. They'll be moral. But on Judgment Day, they go to the same hot lake of fire as the worst drunken pedophile does. So let me show you why there's false professions. Let's do that first. Because we believe that little kids can be saved if they repeat a prayer. I don't know who told us that besides the preacher. But the Bible hasn't told us that. And the Spirit of God works within the Word of God. Am I right? So, amen. So I want to give reasons for false professions and I want to give you what a genuine conversion looks like from the Bible. And then I'm going to jump to 1 John and I want you to think about what the Bible says about saved people and are you there? I think this is a needed message, isn't it? Salvation is the biggest thing. Now let me say beforehand, this message has nothing to do with if I think somebody's lost or saved. That doesn't matter to me. We're going to talk about the substitutional death of Christ every time we meet. Every time. That's why we're here. Amen? So, we talk about these things all the time, and but I like to put things in a special message, especially if I'm going back online with it. I want people to hear some truth, okay? So here we go. Number one, reasons for false confessions. I, I can't think of a better one than parental pressure. Parental pressure. I don't know any parent who really wants to pressure their kid to say a prayer. I don't believe that. But what parent does not want their child saved? Right. Especially at an early age because then it's like, whew, that's over with, right? So parents want their child saved at an early age. The only problem is we, we're in churches where they're saying, yeah, man, get them kids saved. Get them kids saved. I've been in enough churches in my life that those same kids at age 17 are the ones you're chasing around trying to get out of jail and drug addiction and fornication and all that. It's the same kids. Some parents put such a de- uh, push a decision so much and, and the child doesn't understand it. And sometimes doesn't even remember it. A child will say or do anything to gain approval of their parents when they're at a young age. And I want to tell you what, this, this will take away all the confusion. Teach your children about the Bible, about God. Set the boundaries at an early age. God gave children parents to set boundaries. Set those boundaries. So whenever God comes along and says, you're a sinner, the boundaries are already in the kid's mind. He already knows what's right and wrong. What's God's, what's mine, what's dad's, what's mom's, what's mine. He already knows that. And that's what parents are for. We're not to try to get them to say a prayer and believe in Jesus. It's nowhere in the Bible. And when we do that, I believe we give a false confidence that's going to cause them to stay in their sin later. So anyway, I want to tell you something. Um, The Spirit of God has to do the work of repentance. No parent can do that. Amen? And salvation is instant. It's not a gradual salvation. It's an instant salvation that gradually improves. I've not seen one person get saved in the Bible that didn't get baptized in the church. Not a church. The church. I didn't see one. And I've never seen a baby baptized. Never. Or a little kid. So anyway... So, parental pressure. How about this one? Peer pressure. Some people submit to the pressure of going forward. That's especially at like church camp. Stuff like that. And it's the thing to do. Everybody gets to go forward before you go on the hayride and fornicate. You, everybody goes forward and gets special. Who wants to be the oddball? Who wants to be sitting in their chair when God's Spirit is moving so greatly among the kids? I've seen it my whole life. I've been there. Done that. Got the t-shirt. 
Folks, if they're not truly saved, they're going to be forced to live a lie because of peer pressure to keep up with the Joneses. And they don't want to admit in front of everybody else that they're lost. Man, do you see these pressures? Have you all ever had these pressures in your life? I know I have. How about this one? The desire for rewards. Um, Gadgets and rewards today that we give kids for making spiritual decisions, that is nonsense. Junior church, uh, Bible clubs and all this. I, I don't know that I have a problem necessarily with a quote Bible club or anything. I just have to look at it and compare it to the Bible. I would bet most of you, most of them are not scriptural. Um, but John 6.26 says, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. Yep. See, all these kids start seeing other kids get to go up front and be baptized. Oh, they got to go swimming at church. Folks, it happens every day in Baptist Church USA. Here's another one. This one really bothers me. Overly zealous soul winners. Those ones that go and they press for decisions instead of fruit. They don't care. And it's not always on purpose. I'm not saying that they're on purpose. But I've seen people put their foot in a door when somebody's trying to close it of their house. Can I tell you, that's enough to get your teeth knocked out at my house. Now think about it. You don't do that to somebody's house, but boy, these bad... Well, we're just on fire for Christ. And they put that foot in and say, Hey, just say the prayer. Repeat the prayer after me. Call on Jesus to save you and then you'll be okay. And I'll leave. And the person goes, Okay, Lord, thank you for saving us. Boom. Bye. You never see him again. Then somebody else comes along and talks to them and they say, Are you saved? Well, this guy came by and according to what he said, I'm saved. But the man doesn't go to church. The man doesn't even know what a church is. The man's still held in the bondage of sin because of the desire for rewards and overly zealous soul winners. Listen, I want to tell you, being pricked by God is totally different than being pushed by a man. When I was 18, I went into a decision of being pushed by a man. And, and I got baptized again, okay? But I'm telling you, that was not, it was pushed. And but 27, God pricked my heart, and I knew then it had nothing to do with any man. Amen? Here's another reason for false confessions is that kids just don't understand. You can't be, you cannot be saved without an understanding of the gospel. And just knowing Jesus died for me is not an understanding of the gospel. You gotta understand why. Matthew thirteen, nineteen says, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Is that still true today? I wonder how many people have made a false profession because they didn't understand it, and then the truth was stolen away from their hearts. And then now when somebody comes along with, hey man, are you saved? Tell me about your repentance. They get angry with you. They think you're a nut. And they're going to go to hell. And I'm like, wow. So that's some of the reasons that people have false conversions. But now let's talk about genuine conversion for a minute. What it is. What does the Bible have to say about it? Well, first of all, let's point out that salvation is instant. When Christ saves you, it's instant. It's through repentance from the Holy Ghost based on the Word of God. I mean, not just loosely based. I'm talking about the foundation of the very words. (laughs) Salvation, if you can't show in the Bible how you were saved and it match up, you might want to start questioning yourselves. Amen? I've had to do it myself. I'm not not telling you all to do anything I haven't had to do. But it seems like, let me say this, salvation is instant. But let me also tell you this, there seems to be a process before a decision is made. A process of sowing, watering, and reaping. Am I right? There seems to be a process. That process is never seen in door-to-door soul winning with their Uh, by mouth only conversions. It's never seen there. Anyway, um, John 4 tells us this, and herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. 
I sent you to reap whereon ye bestowed no labor. Now, it looks like these apostles and and, uh, prophets went in there pretty quick and got some decisions. But I want you to notice that God had prepared them with other men. He says, other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. There seems to be a process here, doesn't there? I don't know of a heart that can switch on a dime like that. I've never heard of that. And people that do are suspect. 1 Corinthians 3 says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So it seems that most won't be saved the first time they hear the gospel. Am I right? I've heard the gospel so many times. I used to preach the gospel, go on soul winning, win all the awards all the way up my life. But in the shadows, I was a drunken, uh, hard-hearted, mean, half-psycho kid. One evangelist did a survey of saved people, I hear. Now, grain of salt. Okay? And he found that the average believer trusted Christ after hearing the gospel Nine times. Now that comes from uh, David Cloud, I think is where I got that information from. But I can tell you something. It's our job to sow, water, and reap. It's not our job to sell. To sell. That's a different thing. We cannot make corn grow any faster by yelling at it. Salvation is the same way. Amen? Now, so when it comes to young kids, you say, well, what should you do, Brother Sam? Well, saturate their minds with the truth from the Word of God. And show them instruction and and teach them the boundaries. Amen? And let God illumine their hearts when they come to the right age. Boy, that takes away all this worrying about what's the age of accountability and all that. Just teach them right Put the boundaries. And I'm telling you, we got kids today that are not being taught right. And then when they hear about Jesus, it has absolutely no effect because they don't understand right and wrong. All they understand is, well, I do what mommy lets me do as long as it's not too bad. That's what they have. And that's not how salvation is, so they won't understand it. Sincerity is not enough. The only way that a person can be rock solid is when God saves that person biblically. You can see it. And that's why we're about to look biblically of what a person is that is saved. And if any of us that would hear this message does not align with this, it's time to examine ourselves. Whether we be in the faith. Amen? So, I want you to think to yourself. Number one, when did you come to Christ? Just think to yourself. When did you come to Christ? Uh, Number two, why did you come to Christ? Examine yourself. 2 Corinthians 13.5 Was it because of pressure? Was it because of reward? Was it because it felt like the right thing to do that everybody else was doing it? Or was it that the Holy Ghost... uh, shined on your sin-darkened heart, the Word of God, and that Scripture beat you half to death to see that you are absolutely inept to earn anything from God, and then by faith you called out to Christ to save you from hell. Is, Is that what happened? Well, how do I know? Well, first of all, let me say that it's a biblical event. So it's biblical evidence. Not, not, everybody has a salvation the way they want. It is insane. You get, uh, go out to the fair. Me and Walt, you know, it's been, I don't know, a good 12 years or so since we first stood out there at the fair and we had a booth and everything. And people come by and I'd say, well, what church you go to? And everybody, no one said they didn't go to a church. And there was a couple that said Church of Christ, one or two Catholics, but the overwhelming majority were Baptists. Such and such Baptist church. My daddy's the pastor of such and such Baptist church. Baptist, 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 Baptist. Not one 
gave a scriptural testimony of salvation. And not one cared. See, somebody sold them a bill of goods. And they're still walking around the way they are. Some of them thinking they're moral. Mm. So anyway, how can I know? Well, first of all, salvation is a biblical event and it shows evidences in our life. It shows a spiritual life. And spiritual life is not in how flamboyant or how much work we do at the church. A spiritual life is one that's broken before God and believes the Bible and does what He says. So how can I know? Well, James 2.17 says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Boy, we've been learning a lot about how behaviors is what changes the way you feel, the way you think, isn't it? So I won't get into that now. Can you show evidence of your salvation based on Scripture? Hebrews 6 9 says, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Now, people will run to the fruits of the Spirit, and a lot of those fruits are basically inside feelings. Remember, how can you tell if someone's right with God? Is it the way they feel? Or is it the way they act? It's the way, the way they act. What they do. So anybody can say, oh yeah, I've got the love, 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 love down in my heart. Yay! Down in my heart. Yay! I'm saved! Is that, is that what that means? I've got the joy, joy, peace like a river. Is that what I mean? That, and that's what people run to. That, that, well, how do you know you're saved according to the Bible? Well, I know what Jesus did for me, pal. And it doesn't matter what the Bible says to them. Nope. Not at all. And these can be pillars and stanchions of the community, morally speaking. But lost, lost as the Pope. Fruits of salvation are not you saying you have love, joy, peace, meekness, temperance, faith. It's not that you will see it in things like baptism. That's a do, isn't it? That's a do. What do you do after you get saved? You get baptized. Whew, thank God I got that. What if, what if you found that your church was universal church? Would you still accept that baptism? What if your church believes in dispensationalism and the rapture? Are you still going to get baptized? What if your church is a 501c3 corporation instead of a church? Because that's exactly the choice you have. You're either operating as a church under the Holy Spirit or you're operating as a government entity so you can get your little tax break on what you gave to God. It's never feelings. Men can hide behind feelings in their heart because their hearts are wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9. And then other men go right along with it because their hearts are wicked. But I want you to know that fruits are obvious to others. Not you. Others. Fruits are obvious. Now, I'm pretty good with apple trees now that I'm cherries and Bradford pears and things that I can tell you what they are without seeing any fruits. But you know how I absolutely know? Because sometimes these... These trees down south, they all look alike. Like, like dogwoods and cherries, they look alike until a certain time. And, and, and so you're not really sure, but then when you get up on it and you see the fruit, now you know. Now you know exactly what it is. Is it an orange tree? Is it a pear tree? How do we know? Because men can see it. Men can touch it. Men can taste it. It's not just you going, yeah, I got the joy, 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 joy. No! It's people seeing it. What is your baptism that people have seen publicly? What are your fruits? Do you walk in the Spirit? Do men see it? Are you hospitable? All these things. Anyway, John reveals to us the fruits of salvation. So let's go to 1 John and that's where we'll end today. So, 1 John chapter 1, and I want us to notice verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie 
and do not the truth. So are you walking in light? Here's what I mean. I walk with Him. I have fellowship with Him. But I don't care what church I go to. Or it doesn't matter which Bible you have. You know, it doesn't matter if we dress modestly as women. It doesn't matter about things like birth control and women in their place instead of being out in careers, being underneath their husband at home. They don't care about stuff like that. Not at all. Because wait a second, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, anything but truth is darkness, can I tell you? Anything but truth is darkness. We lie. And it doesn't say we don't believe the truth. It says we do not the truth. You know why we do not the truth? Because we don't have the truth. That's why. How about this one? Do you respect God? Do you respect His opinions more than yours? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? You say, yeah, but it's Sam, I don't want to be a fanatic. I mean, you know, you're not saved. Or you say, sir, do you, do you know the Lord? I'm good. You're not saved. You don't even know what you're saying. Oh, me and the man upstairs, we're tight. You don't know what you're saying. You're lost. Right. Amen. Well, you know, me and the big guy, you're lost. John 3.19 says, This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light. Let's move on. So number one, do you walk in light? Number two, look at 1 John 2.5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Hmm. Does this... Bible control your thinking? Does this Bible control your goals? Does this Bible control your decisions? Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. But you know what? People like to find something that sounds spiritual and justify themselves. All you have to do is turn on Rick and Bubba one time and they start talking about man church and all this they're doing and it's all a joke. Yep. Now, I'm, I'm not against something that's going to make men you know, pay attention to their families and stuff like that. Yeah, I have no problem with that. I don't care who does it. Amen? That's okay. But when you get together and say that's what the Lord's doing and it has nothing to do with well, church, people say, well, we don't want church here. We want all religions. Is that how God works? If that's how He works, then fine. But it's not. Only people that don't know the Lord think that way. They want something that sounds spiritual. Number three, 1 John 2.15 Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, it drives me crazy that people will come in here. You know, we, we see a lot, a lot of people, a lot of families come in this building. And many times they'll come back here and they'll start talking about church and all these great things they see and stuff. But then you see how their kids are dressed. They got to get ready for their dances. They got to get, they got to uh, their their plays. Their, everything's the world. Uh, that's not somebody who's saved. I'm gonna tell you right now. After I got saved, I wasn't saved very long. Before I walked down to school, yanked my kid right out of there. Amen. Because it was wrong, and I'm saved now, and I want to live for the Lord. But people won't do that. They won't think anything about it. Won't think a thing about it. And 1 John 2.15 makes it clear if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So what are you willing to give up for Christ? Is it your clothing? Your hairstyle? Your TV? Your habits? Friends? What are you willing to give up for Christ? Because if, that, if you're not willing to give up for Christ, I hate to tell you, you're going with the world's approach, the world's attire, the world's uh, way to do things, and you're getting any adoration from the world. That's lost people. That's how lost people work. Not saved people. We make mistakes as saved people. I mean, sometimes we can even sin on purpose. We can get that bitter. Amen? We can do that. But overall, we don't go out of God's realm. He still chastens us and brings us right back. And when we testify to others, we will say stuff like, yes, that was wrong. Instead of justifying ourselves. Number four. 
First John two eighteen. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. As a church, where does our unction come from? The Holy Ghost of God. Not only are we saved, but this is the temple of God. God moves in this church. And people that, that say that they're leaving, uh, like, like that big row we had lately, where people all just left, no one talked to the person they were angry at. Not one of them. Everybody just accused and all this stuff. Um, what, what's the problem there? What, does the, what did the Bible just say about those people? They're lost. They're lost. Mm. They're not faithful. Christianity is what God wants from us. He does not want churchianity. He wants Christianity. So are you faithful? I'm not talking about going to church. I'm talking about in your life. I'm talking about when you find you've sinned against your loved one, you go back and you get it right. Are you faithful? Because that's how saved people act according to the Bible. I can find that, but I can't find kids getting saved. Well, let's keep going here. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself, even as He is pure. Does your daily life reflect the prospect of Christ's return? Is your life designed that when Jesus comes back, you want to be found watching and waiting? Amen? I'm just going to go a little faster now. Look at 1 John 3 and verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, obviously, this is not saying you'll never sin again as a person who's saved. That, that just don't make sense when you look at what Abraham and David and Elijah and Jonah and everyone went through. Okay, Peter, you know what they went through. He's talking about continuing in sin. Sinning on purpose. Hey, let's go out and smoke some cigarettes. You know, and I'm going to keep doing it. Well, the Bible don't say much about it. Blah, blah, blah. That's not a saved person. Because they're not sensitive to sin. You know, it ought to, it ought, it ought to blow your mind, Dad, if your 13-year-old girl walks, to the, walks into the house and she's got makeup on her face. That ought to blow your mind. Because why does she have it on? What's the purpose of putting... Is that a biblical concept or is that a worldly concept? It's a worldly concept. And why? Well, so they can look natural. I thought they looked natural... I thought the definition of natural was not add anything. Right? It ought to blow your minds, but not today. You see entire youth groups, such and such Baptist church, shorts, makeup all over, rings, this and that. Everything. It's an exact, direct violation of what the Bible says. And then, okay, okay, folks, before we, before we have fun, remember we got to pray and all the kids are like, oh yeah, we got to pray. Come on, let's pray. Pray. Now we're back to our fun. We've all done it. The lockouts or lock-ins, you call them. We've all been there and seen it. And every time, there's no depth to it. And they're not sensitive to sin. Man, I want to tell you what, I'm, I'm afraid to sin. If I do anything that's questionable, I want to take it back and forth through the Word of God to make sure I'm doing what God wants me to do. That I'm not in any way just sinning because I want to. How about this? There in 1 John 3.9, it tells us you're sensitive to sin. But look at 3.14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. What is that saying about us? If we don't love the brethren. People say, oh, thank goodness I like going to church. Well, what's your church? If your church is Protestant, that's not brethren. 
If your church is a 501c3 corporation, I wouldn't call that brethren. <laughs> Amen? If your church is uh, all these things that you can't find in the Bible, especially children getting saved, I hate to tell you, you're in the wrong place. And if it doesn't bother you, the thing is, you'll desire the world more than Christianity. Real Christians. Being around people who bear the same fruit. Amen? That says that that is a, a, a signifier of being saved. Is that not what it says? Man, this is down to earth, isn't it? I mean, this will hit you right between the teeth if you're lost. Hopefully it hits you right between the heart. Because I needed it and I know everybody else does too. Alright, here we go. 1 John 3.22 And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So do you desire to converse with God? Has He answered you? What do you pray for? Or do you only pray when you get in trouble or when things are not going your way? See, that's a worldly person. That's not a saved person. We're almost done here. And, and of course, someone who's lost and hearing this is probably saying, thank God. <clears throat> do you have any discernment? 1 John 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out in the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is coming into the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is not of God. And this is the Spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. Let me ask you something. Do you believe all Christianity is okay? If you do, you're lost. Do you believe Billy Graham was a saved man? You're lost. Do you think any of these TV preachers are of God? You're lost. Do you think a woman preacher is okay? You're lost. You don't have any discernment. Do you know why you don't have any discernment? Because you're lost. You don't have the Spirit of God. You can't easily cut through false teaching. Like a little while ago, I quoted David Cloud. I have nothing against David Cloud. Not at all. He does his thing. I do mine. And of course, he's very popular and so on. I don't dislike him. But I can't use everything he says. Because he believes children can be saved. Right? So I don't have a problem with that. But at the same time, is is David, Jeremiah, Charles Stanley, Billy Graham, is that your people? Because if they are, hate to tell you, you don't know God. There's nothing there in that. At some point, you're going to dry up and blow away from radio and TV preaching. One more. 1 John 4.13 Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and He in us because He hath given us of His Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit convict you when you sin? Or do you just carry emotions around of pride? You know, getting mad at preaching, that's not what I'm talking about. See, that's the way lost people act. You, you, you preach something that they're doing. And, and I know Jesus didn't just go and nail everything they do. He, he, he pointed to Himself for righteousness. And they got so angry at Him. And instead of being convicted of sin, they're angry. Because they have no spiritual growth. Do you love your Bible? Do you read it and understand it? Do you get it to grow? Now I said ten things here and all ten are evidences of salvation. All ten. You can't right now go, well I made a 90, I'm 9 out of 10. There's no passing grade other than 100%. Either you're in Christ or you're not. So who are the many that will be rejected by Christ? It's going to be those who have prayed a prayer or tried to turn their lives around through pressure, rewards without repentance, overly zealous soul winners, lack of understanding. And according to Hebrews 6.9, they do not have the things that accompany salvation. They may have some things, 
but they don't have all ten. Examine yourselves. Second Corinthians thirteen five. Whether you be in the faith. Paul is telling Christians to do that. But I get a lot of flack over it. People get angry at me when I say examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Well, I'll bet you he you know what, he's so high minded, he thinks I'm lost and he's saved. I don't think any of that. What I think is the gospel needs to be preached. And I know the biggest problem is people aren't saved. You know what's the problem with our youth groups? They're not saved. You know why your youth director wants to talk about boogers and do stuff like that and eat groat stuff and act like he's 12? Because he's not saved. That's why. Amen? Uh, why the preacher won't preach on anything and then just no matter what you say or do, everything's happy, go lucky, it doesn't matter. There's no such thing as discipline anymore. The Lord's table is not surrounded by discipline anymore. Why? Because that guy's probably lost. Right. Folks, it's a huge problem. And I can't just look at somebody in their eyes and go, yeah, I think you're saved. I, boy, that'd be a cult if we did that, wouldn't it? But I know this, there's fruits that accompany it. And I know when I looked at, at baptism after I got saved, I didn't look at it at first. It took me... I was in the ministry 13 years before I got baptized. Can you believe that? Because I didn't have a, a, a doctrinal ordination or anything. But once that got straight, I'm telling you, my life has changed. And when I saw it, when I saw, hey, wait a second... Am I being baptized into the kingdom or am I being baptized into something Protestant? I had to look for it because I want to be right with God. That's how saved people act. Saved people aren't just nice people. Sometimes they're not that nice. I didn't read this morning where Nehemiah taught them with switches and branches. I didn't read that. I didn't read where Jesus went over and turned over every temple and ran them all out. Okay? But... There's fruits of salvation. It's stuff that you can see. It's not like, hey, there's no horse pulling that cart. How's it going? Oh, this is a horse. This is my horse that I prayed for when I was six. It's not there. It's not moving. It's real when you can see it. It's real and others can see it. You can see it. It's settled. And it's not about going to heaven when you die. It's about living for the Lord now. Amen? So anyway, I hope that message helped a little bit and strengthened you in the Word of God concerning that issue. Um, So God bless you.